Good afternoon, Year 12. Today we're going to be talking about an extract from a very famous writer called Flora MacDonald Mayer. It's a novel called The Rector's Daughter. It's semi-autobiographical. Uh, these days, Flora MacDonald Mayer doesn't sell well anymore. Uh, she's actually disappeared from the canon. But in her day, she was considered a wonderful writer and a writer who wrote woman-centered novels. I think that's really important, in which the female protagonist highlighted the difficulties. And she's someone that you might be able to connect to, say, novels like The Mill on the Floss or Middlemarch, the great Victorian tradition of female writers looking at the difficulties that women faced and actually seeing that in many cases lives are wasted and that there are all kinds of barriers towards women's progression and women's education. Okay, This is a picture of Flora MacDonald Mayer. What I wanted to point out about her that's really interesting is that she was one of the first women to attend Cambridge. Okay, She was an educated woman herself. Uh, she was the daughter of a priest herself, a clergyman. And she is a woman who also decided not to get married after having a number of failed relationships with men. Uh, so her heroines often are unmarried females, and in particular we're going to be looking at one today called Mary Jocelyn, who, like Flora MacDonald Mayer, is the daughter of a clergyman. Okay. Just wanted to remind you before we go into the passage itself of the assessment objectives. I think I've said many times that A01 is the most important. Okay, 28% of your grade will come from your structure of your argument, your ability to paragraph, to put a proper argument together, to be coherent, to use connectives, and to flow really in your argument. A02, we all know, is language, form, and structure. But what I want to focus on today is A03, 24%. It's quite a great deal. So by the time of the examination, I need you to know the different eras quite well and to be able to put a text into context. Don't forget that this A-level English Lit has a very strong historical foundation. So the study of English literature now is deeply interwoven with history. So the more history you know, the better. You know that I've produced a booklet for you. And in the booklet, you will have a history, a brief history of each of the different literary epochs. So I strongly recommend that you look at that. AO4, which is the connection, is worth less. It's only three marks out of 25, okay? And AO5, again, is also only worth three marks out of 25. That's where we talk about different interpretations, isn't it, okay? So we always want to see the word alternatively occurring in each and every one of your essays, okay? There are the marks. I've already talked through them. I don't need to go through that more, okay? Just in terms of the structure of your uh, arguments, we're going to be doing one later. Don't forget that we've argued that we think that we need a three-paragraph structure. The introduction should be quite brief. It should de uh, define key terms, and it should show a very clear thesis of how you're going to argue. The paragraphs, I've said before, are either additive, so you're using uh, connectives like moreover, furthermore, another reason, likewise, simile, or the connectives will be contrasting, obviously like in contrast or however, where you are showing a different di uh, dimension to the argument. If possible, it is best to argue both for and against the statement because it shows greater subtlety in your argument, okay? However, don't end up contradicting yourself or simply sitting on the fence. I'm sure you know what I mean by sitting on the fence. Do come out on one side if possible. Um, I've gone through many of these connectives, so I don't think I need to go through these again. I'll just leave this on the presentation to remind you of the kind of language and phrases that you'll need. Likewise, I think we've gone through this idea that there are three possible arguments where you're in complete agreement, where you modify and have some kind of resolution over here, the idea is you'd argue in favor, go against the statement, have some kind of resolution is the final bit. Or you can oppose the statement entirely, and then in that case, you've got three paragraphs that go against the statement explaining why.
Returning to Flora MacDonald Mayer now, so she was born in 1872, which means that she catches the tail end of Victorian times. Don't forget Victorian times go all the way from 1832 all the way through to 1902. What follows Victorian times then is Edwardian. In Britain, they tend to, uh, as each monarch changes, so they change the age. It doesn't mean that there's a clean break and that you can tell the difference between Victorian and Edwardian. Do you recall before I urge you not to see history in two generalized terms? As soon as you start saying things like Edwardians, all Edwardians, Victorians, you are talking rubbish, are you not? Because not everybody is homogenous. You can talk about there was a tendency. You could talk about trends. But just as now, do we all agree at the moment in the 21st century? Clearly not, because if we look at the United States, half the country voted for Donald Trump, half the country rioted against him. So we're talking about a highly divided society. So can we talk about America in 2017? Not really. Like all ages, Victorian age, Edwardian age is riddled with conflict. And therefore I urge you to try to use terms like the dominant, the residual, the emergent, the progressive elements of the culture. If you want to be a little bit fancy, you can talk about the avant-garde, a French term which means the leaders, the progressives, the people who look for change. The opposite of the avant-garde is the vanguard. They're the people who want to keep things back and stop change. Or we could talk about the progressives and the conservatives. But each and every age will have different parts to it. So careful with the generalizations, okay? Flora MacDonald's mother was um, Alexandrina Jessie Grote, okay? She was the niece of a utilitarian, that is a nonconformist, a different religion, as well as the Anglican clergyman and Cambridge moral ph philosopher, Professor John Grote. I wanted you to see so she comes from a very highly educated background, and have a look at this. She attends Newham College, Cambridge. Now that's quite interesting to readers of Atonement, is it not? Because Cecilia attends Cambridge, doesn't she? In the uh, 1930s. Do you remember that she still doesn't get a proper degree? Does she? So if we think about Flora MacDonald Mayer, she would have gone to Cambridge, but it was very segregated in those days. It wasn't the same degree as men, and women weren't awarded a degree. So don't think because she went to Cambridge, she just has access to power. Arguably, she has a sense of that patriarchal world, but by no means did she have any kind of equality with men. So as I said before, The Rector's Daughter is published in 1924, and in the extract we're going to look at, we're going to be looking at Mary Jocelyn, who's the daughter of the rector, and she has given up many, many years of selfish devotion to her father. She's never married. We are not given her exact age at, at the time of this novel, but she's certainly in her, in her 30s. And I'm going to be talking to you about this idea that just like the wife was meant to be the angel in the house, in many cases the daughter was also meant to be devoted to her father. And this is who uh, Flora MacDonald Mayer is going to concentrate on. She's going to show the damage that this kind of sacrifice and devotion causes to women because it means that they never grow up to sexual maturity. They don't have romantic relationships. They're unable to marry. Now today, I was talking to the other class about this, this is often seen as a heroic status, is it not, girls? Sex in the city idea, that actually married women are really sad domestic drudges. So there's actually almost a kind of sexy, glamorous idea of being in your 30s and avoiding marriage today, is there not? Okay. However, if we think about the time in which this novel is set, and it's set before the First World War, there's no such opportunity for women. Economically, they're dependent, aren't they? They have to live off their families. There were very few job opportunities for women then, like secretarial work and clerical work was still mainly male. So I want you to understand that being a spinster was a pretty dark and bleak fate for most women because, you know, without 
access to the public world, the public sphere. Their lives were quite lonely in many cases. In the passage that we're going to look at, um, Mr. Robert Herbert, who's her father's friend, seemed very interested in Mary, and it looked as though they were going to get married. But by the time that this passage takes place, he's given up on her, and he's decided to marry somebody else. So she realizes now that in all likelihood, she is going to be alone and a spinster for the rest of her life. I wanted to give you a little bit of background now, okay? Flora MacDonald Mayer did not belong to Bloomsbury, but I would like you to know about the Bloomsbury set. They were writers and intellectuals writing after the Victorian period. They were made up, as I said, of writers, intellectuals, philosophers, and artists. Some of the most famous were Virginia Woolf, an incredibly famous writer. You need to know about her because she invented the term stream of consciousness, okay? John Maynard Keynes, who's the most famous British economist next to um, Adam Smith. Ian Forster, uh, uh, openly homosexual, very progressive writer who wrote the novel A Passage to India. And Lytton Scraichi, who we're going to talk about a lot today, who was a journalist and a historical writer. Now, according to Ian Oosbury, although the members of uh, Bloomsbury denied being a group in the formal sense, they were united by the belief uh, that the arts were incredibly important. So they all pushed the arts, and they all disliked the business community, and they all argued that people needed culture. They needed art, and that this was part of a progressive and intellectual way of living your life, and you would not have positive political change unless people read novels and were properly educated. So many of them were wedded to progressive causes, uh, like socialism, like feminism. They tended to be against the war. They tended to be pacifists. And very importantly, here's a picture of Bloomsbury is an actual place in London. You can go and see it now. They tended to gather and do their meetings in Bloomsbury. They were very, very important in terms of condemning the Victorian age. Here is Lytton uh, Scraichi. Can you see him there with his strange beard? He was, again, a, a socialist, a pacifist, uh, a homosexual guy. And he was very against the war and imperialism. And he wrote a book that I'm going to tell you about called Eminent Victorians. Okay? Eminent Victorians was an attack on the Victorian age. It took the most famous figures of the Victorian age, some of them who had incredibly great reputations, Florence Nightingale. He actually does this biography of her, and he, he says that she's a horrible, spiteful cow. And he takes all of these famous Victorian figures, and he attacks them. Why am I telling you about this? Because even today, do we have a positive view of the Victorian age, do you feel? No. And it's Scraichy and Bloomsbury who attacked the Victorian age and made them seem like a bunch of straight-laced hypocrites. And it's partly because of this incredibly famous book called Eminent Victorians, which uh, was started in 1912 and was published by 1917. And in this book, Scraichy begins by seeing the Victorians as hypocrites, but by with the outbreak of the First World War, he blames the Victorians for the First World War, and he says because they are so small-minded, so arrogant, they saw life in black and white, and they were so wedded to imperialism and violence that he believes the Victorians were profoundly evil, and he blames the First World War on them. In the aftermath of the First World War, the British public were really angry. So many men had died, so much suffering had occurred, that he actually argues that the Victorians should be condemned. And I think that's the version that we have of the Victorians today. The Victorians didn't see themselves as straight-laced conservatives. They saw themselves as pioneers. But eminent Victorians helped to change the perception and to see the Victorians as the old guard, as stuffy. So people like Dr. Arnold, who was a very famous headmaster, and there's a book called Tom Brown's School Days, some of you may have heard of that before, in which uh, Dr. Arnold was seen as a wonderful headmaster. Instead, Scraichy describes him as a really foolish man obsessed by order who ignored the sciences, 
who was backward in many ways. And so this was very damaging for Arnold's reputation. And in the wake of the First World War, many people were prepared to believe this kind of idea. Okay. Now the passage that we're going to look at today, uh, I've set the question, explore the view that Mary is the victim of selfishness on the part of her father. Okay. And again, we're going to need contextual background that looks at the idea of what happens to devoted daughters. Okay. Now, as I said before, female obedience was enshrined in Victorian ideology. And even though the novel is set after the Victorian period, you still have a lot of Victorian residual history of the angel in the house. Okay. And as I said, this extended to the idea of being a very dutiful daughter. Here is a very famous painting by an American artist called Benjamin Stahl, and it's entitled Victorian Parents and Spinster Daughter. And if you actually think about it, it's quite a sad picture, isn't it? You know, the daughter looks very beautiful in it, and she contrasts with the parents. But obviously, this is part of the fate that actually occurred to many daughters who didn't get the opportunity to go out into the outside world. They become cloistered, and in many ways, they become forgotten by the world, okay? I want to remind you that as this book is written, that there is huge uh, uh, gains for women at this time, okay? The suffragettes who fought from the late Victorian age through the First World War, well, they won. And at the end of the First World War, women's right to vote is established. The first country in the world is New Zealand, followed closely by Canada, the United States, and Britain. Now, if you think about Victorian times, these were women who were force-fed, who were imprisoned, and all kinds of things, but by 1918, women have the vote. What an amazing difference in the perception of gender. And we can see it in the figure of Jordan Baker, can't we, in uh, The Great Gatsby. So now, what I want to do is to look at the rector's daughter and to consider this question. Uh, over here, we're going to explore the view that Mary is the victim of selfishness on the part of her father. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to ask you to read the passage, and I'm going to ask you in our normal way to plan an answer. We're going to plan an answer for about 15 minutes. We're going to decide what our three neon quotes are, our three main quotes, and we're going to decide how are we going to uh, conduct this particular essay.